Hi, welcome to part two of my Stonehenge experience video and I will just do a very very quick recap before I crack on and tell you the rest of this story. So on Saturday the 24th of November 1990 we had me and the person I was with at the time had made a journey from near Bath in the West Country to back to London via Stonehenge. Now we did this for what I would call aesthetic reasons because it was a beautiful night and thought it, the person I was with, Tim, thought it would be a good idea because it would be a nice way to make the journey a bit more interesting and it was a beautiful night. So we did it purely because it would have looked nice, not because we were looking for any sort of strange unexplained experience or to have any spiritual connection with Stonehenge. None of that was at all relevant to us at that point. He just decided it would be a nice diversion for us to make the journey a bit more interesting. So we stopped as planned by Stonehenge, by which point um, we had been pursued by a large ball of orange light. We stopped somewhere by the hillstone here. The orange light was over here, which I was mesmerised by and Tim, the person I was with, was not for some reason. We were here, the engine was running on the car, he was more interested in looking the, at the moon over the stones. That went on for I don't know how long, it's impossible to say, far longer than it seemed at the time. Judging by the amount of time that elapsed, it was roughly about 45 minutes when it seemed like minutes. Um, during the time that he was um, involved with looking at the moon over Stonehenge, he went to get his camera out of the boot of the car and saw a large, about seven foot tall, approximately black figure coming at him towards from from the from the stones behind the fence. When he looked again, the figure had crossed somehow across the fence, was right behind him. He told me to get in the car. Thankfully, he'd left the engine running, and we shot off. And before and after we had approached Stonehenge, we went through a barrier of a barrier, a line of mist going across the road. We went through that on entering and leaving and before we entered that barrier there was traffic and during the time we were here there was no traffic and when we went out the other side and went through the barrier of mist again there was traffic again. I hope that wasn't a too garbled. Please listen to part one of this video and then you'll get the story in full. That's my basic recap. I just wanted to make it very clear that we had stopped here not to have some sort of strange experience that just happened. We just went there because it would have been a pleasant place to break the journey and to look at the lovely evening. So, as I said, we went back to London and we were talking to my flatmate who got us to write notes, which was brilliant of her to do that. And we were so spooked, having recounted the story to her and actually taken in what had happened to us, that we actually ended up sleeping on her floor because we were so frightened by this. The next day... Um, I thought I need to get some answers. Now our, our natural inclination, even though we were quite frightened, was to go back in daylight to Stonehenge and to sort of see whether we could find any clues to what had happened. But that was unfeasible But because we both had work the next day and it just was not practical. It was a long journey and we were tired from the night before and no, it wasn't practical. So what could I do to get some answers? Bearing in mind, this is 1990, it's well before I wrote any books or anything else, it's well before I really knew what was going on. I'd had a lifetime of strange experiences, but I didn't really know anything, to be honest. Um, I didn't have any understanding, and so I needed, I needed to ask other people what was going on. Specifically, I wanted to find out whether anything else had been reported. Now, this was very naive of me. But I actually phoned up what was then the Stonehenge Visitor Centre, which now looks like this monstrosity. Stonehenge is a very different place than it was in 1990. That is just uh, an abomination that doesn't fit in with the landscape at all. But back in 1990, I'm sure that in order to go to this visitor centre, bearing in mind I didn't know this at the time in 1990 because I hadn't actually been there in the daylight, I think you went somehow underneath this road, the A344, and you came out in this tunnel that was the only way to access the stones because there's a fence all the way along here. I think you had to come from the car park and go underneath here and come out here and somewhere you had to pay underneath there somewhere. There was a visitor centre where you had to pay. So I phoned them up. I got the number from directory inquiries and I phoned up the visitor centre and, you know, being 
just <laughs> very honest and naive as I was, I said, was anything reported strange at the Stones last night? And, and the, the chap said, no. And I said, can you tell me whether there were secu security guards working last night? And he said, yes, there are always security guards working and they carry torches. And I said, so if we stopped where we'd stopped, which was here, if we'd stopped near to the Stones and we were hanging around, would they have approached us? And they said, of course they would. You know, they would. that's the first thing they would do. That's what their job is, basically. Of course they would have done. Um, but they didn't. They didn't see anybody at all last night. You, you know, and I said, well, well, we were there last night. No, you weren't there last night. Yes, we, yes, I said, we were there last night. And I said, we saw something very strange there. Um, and I, <laughs> stupidly, naively, I started to describe the orange ball of light that I'd seen. And he said, well, it's a, it was a flare. It's Salisbury Plain. It was a flare. And I was very calm and, and measured and I wasn't standing at all hysterical. And I said, you know, I know what I saw and it wasn't a flare. There was nobody there. There was no security guards and there was this orange ball of light. And he basically, this chap from the visitor centre said that I was drunk. I was delusional and he put the phone down on me. So I knew that I wasn't going to get any further with that. And I was pretty upset, actually, because I'd approached him in, you know, in a... in. <sighs> not not being at all kind of sounding like a lunatic and he treated me pretty much as I was so I knew that that was a dead end and that we couldn't go back there on on that Sunday the day afterwards um so we decided that we would go back the following weekend we'd make another visit to see Tim's family perhaps or we would just go straight to Stonehenge and have a look around ourselves but during the week, I decided that I would do some other research as best as I could because, you know, as I said in the first video, this is 1990 and magazines, a few magazines, books in the library, th those are the places that you would find out information. And I did find some information about um, there had been a few reports of, of balls of light and giants as well around Stonehenge but there were very few and far between and nothing very solid and not, nothing that I could say that's definitely like our experience but I did come across the name of somebody called Arthur Shuttlewood who was a journalist and writer who'd written a lot about UFOs in Warminster which was somewhere very close by in Wiltshire so I decided through director inquiries that I was going to phone up Arthur Shuttlewood and tell him our experience because not only did I want to understand what had happened, but I also wanted to share it. It was such an extraordinary experience. I just wanted, I wanted to share it with somebody who would believe me. It was really important to me. So I phoned up Arthur Shuttlewood and I think I got one of his sons or his son or, uh, or relation. And they told me that he was very ill and he couldn't speak to me, but they did take my number and they were very polite to me. And didn't, you know, treat me like the chap at the, the visitor centre at Stonehenge had. But Arthur Shuttlewood never got back to me and I found out through a bit of research that I did um, for this video that he died in, in 1996. So I think he must have been in decline then. He never got back to me. So our only... <laughs> all we could do, really, was to retrace our journey the following weekend. That's all we could do. We had no other way of finding out any other information or speaking to other people or or getting any sort of clarity in our heads about what had actually happened. So we retraced the journey the following Saturday. OK, the first thing is, number one, we came up, we did the exact same. It was a very difficult thing, but we, we came in exactly the same way as we would have done. We didn't follow the London route backwards. We, we, we went round so we'd come in from the bath direction exactly as we had the following week. The first thing we both noticed is that the, when the orange ball of light initially appeared above the junction where we'd had to wait to turn onto the A344, I think it's called, there was a big bank of trees. It was a really thick bank of trees. When we got back there the following week, there was a few trees. It was... <sighs> there were hardly any trees. There was not, not what you would think of as a wood, and yet we both... In our notes, we both clearly described it as a wood. There were there was a thick bank of trees. So that was the first thing. That was a bit odd. We thought, OK, fair enough. So we then came up and we parked in exactly the same place. Bearing in mind, this is the middle of the afternoon, so it wasn't so spooky. It was a little bit off-putting. We both felt a bit of trepidation, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't night time. There were plenty of people about this time. It was normal, in inverted commas. 
We stopped by the thing, we did exactly the same thing, I got out of the car and then I realised this. So we were here back again by the heelstone, here, as we had been and okay. I've got a few, vid a few pictures of this. So I would have been standing here and this is the fence as was and the previous Saturday I had been able to rest my hand on this stone quite comfortably as if the fence wasn't even there I mean none of this makes sense I know it doesn't make sense but it is true and if it wasn't true I really wouldn't be bothering to tell you this but I was able to rest my hand on this stone now I'm about five foot five this stone is 15 foot high and the fence probably is about six foot and not only could you not reach through the fence, but you couldn't reach across this distance to rest your hand flat unless you had Mr Tickle very long arms to do so. So when we went back that following Saturday, I realised that that was actually impossible. What I'd done the previous Saturday was impossible. I'll show you another picture of this just to prove my point. So there is the fence. So if that's 15 foot high, the fence is coming up roughly halfway. I was on the other side of this fence, yet my hand was resting against it. It's actually physically impossible. There's somebody on a bike for scale there. I could not have stood with my hand, not even stretched, just flat on this stone. Also, the stone, oh, sorry, the stone has a tilt on it. You can see it quite clearly here. So not only is it not just upright so I could have rested on it, it's actually pointing away. It would have been actually physically impossible and yet I promise you I did that. And here's another picture of the heelstone with that impassable fence. And the fence, when we looked at it, when we went back on that day, when we looked at it, the fence had been there for a long time. It hadn't just been erected in the previous week. It had been there for quite a long time. We made sure, again, Tim was a very um, practical sort of person and he wasn't going to be taken in by any anything like that. And he made sure that that fence had been there for a long time. So by this point, we we're feeling quite... <laughs> It, the, the strangeness of the previous week had got much, much stranger. And also, the as Tim pointed out, the henge itself had been a lot closer. I know it doesn't make sense, but when I'd been um, resting on the stone that I couldn't possibly have been resting on, he was looking at the moon and the stones were this everything seemed much much closer it wasn't it wasn't dark we went there because it was a moonlit night everything was very well lit it was it was ridiculously well lit actually uh you know, there's no lights there no um man-made lights there it was all very well lit you could see that that was a lot closer i just we were getting more and more confused and the and the, and the um the thing that really bothered him was he was repeating that phrase that the the big black the big black figure had been walking through deep leaves now as you can see there are no trees this is salisbury plain it's a stonehenge there are no trees let alone leaves and yet he'd heard this he'd heard it so clearly that he kept repeating it it was like it was important that this big black horrible figure entity whatever it was had been walking through the deep leaves and there quite clearly were no deep leaves whatsoever <sighs> right so we just did not know what was going on and then we started to put things together a bit we couldn't obviously you couldn't explain things like why i was leaning on this stone why there were no deep leaves, why there was no bank of trees, uh, but mainly this stone, because, you know, he'd seen quite clearly that I was leaning on the stone. It was a physical, it was, it was beyond a physical impossibility. It just could not have happened, and yet it did. So then we started thinking about things like the mist. We'd driven through the mist, and all the traffic had disappeared, and it, it, it was, just was not feasible for that to have happened. There was nobody. And when we looked, when we looked all around there were lights there were there was the, there are buildings there, there would have been lights visible there was no sign of humanity at all in during this time that we were 
locked into this this orange light and and experience there was nobody there was no lights there was no sign of of modern life whatsoever and then when we drove back out through the band of mist then we saw traffic again but the whole thing was like a dream not so much like a dream that we didn't know what was going on it seemed normal at the time and we didn't know that the things we were doing were impossible or rather that i was doing there was you know we didn't know that so everything seemed entirely normal but at the same time not like a dream like a really vivid dream where you think that you you know weird things are happening but you take them as entirely normal but I would not have known that that was impossible. In this reality, whatever this reality was, and I have no idea what this reality was, that it was normal that I could lean on this stone. Although, let's just go back quickly. That just shows you how absolutely impossible that is. Completely impossible. So, before I move on, which I will do now, um, this figure that he saw... This is the closest thing I could find to anything, and it isn't really anything like it, but somebody took a photograph of this in a field in Wiltshire, and this is what it looks like when you zoom in on it. I don't know whether that bears any resemblance to the figure he saw. I do not know. And again, how could the figure that he saw have got through this fence? None of it made any sense. So we drove back to London again, absolutely clueless. And I have remained pretty much clueless about this ever since. Of course, my understanding is a lot different now. Of course it is. But I still don't know what happened. And then to make things even more strange, when I started to research this video for you, I realised some things that were also impossible that I didn't know before I started making these videos. Right, firstly, we stopped by this stone. We stopped in a lay-by, or we parked there. I don't know how we did that. We did do it, but I don't know how we did it. Because that's a track. That picture that I showed you with the person on the bicycle, that is like a track between the road and, and the fence. You can see it here. There's the road that we were on. That's the road we came in on, went out on. I don't know where we parked there. There isn't a lay-by, and yet we stopped right here. We were right by that stone. I know that because we couldn't have parked on the other side of the road. We didn't cross the road. We were right next to it. I literally got out of the car and put my hand on that stone and watched that orange ball of light over there. And yet... When I look at pictures from that sort of time, that era before everything was changed in Stonehenge area, this is 1986, which was four years before, there is no lay-by there. There is a track that goes right the way along here, but it's nowhere to pull in, really. You can't... In fact, it actually stops there. You, I don't know where we stopped. That, to be honest, finding this out now, it just... This is... <sighs> all these years later and it's made me feel even more strange about it because I don't know where we we were there we were there but I don't know where we stopped I just don't I'm not going to labor that point but you can see what I mean I just don't know then the final thing that really foxed me completely um is we stopped at Stonehenge that evening because it was a beautiful moonlit evening and the whole sky it was brightly lit as I said there's no absolutely no road lights there there was no signs of any habitation there was nothing the, the, the night was completely dark you know you could see the sky clearly there was no clouds there was what would have had to have been a waxing or at least full going towards full moon so I wanted to make sure of that so I looked up the moon phases for November 1990 thank you internet for these resources and I discovered to my absolute amazement and discomfort really that the 24th when we were there there was a waxing crescent nowhere near the moon that we saw or that was lighting up the sky it was just a waxing crescent it was not anywhere near full the nearest full moon would have been the saturday before and we were definitely there on a saturday 
But we went straight back and we wrote up our notes, the notes that I referred to when I wrote it up in my book. The book here, this book, which I wrote it up in five years later, I referred to the notes that we'd written on Saturday the 24th, 1990. We didn't get the date wrong. We wrote it up straight away that evening. I can't really see how we would have confused that for the previous Saturday, November the 3rd, not the previous Saturday, but the, the Saturday when the full, the moon would have been waxing full. Can you see that? So on the night we were there, when we wrote our notes, when we made a note of the date and November the 24th, it was just a crescent. It makes no sense to me. Any of this makes no sense to me. Now, the reason I referred to it in the video I made for Ray Beth's book when she was talking about portals, I call this perhaps a portal experience because of the strip of mist and what happened in the middle. This place, this reality, this wherever this was, this is not... It, we went somewhere else, didn't we? We weren't in the ordinary reality. We weren't in consensus reality. Everything was in the wrong place. It's just that we didn't know it at the time. I didn't know that stone was in the wrong place. I can even say now we didn't know that the, the, the moon shouldn't have been like that. I don't know. Everything's just wrong about this. It's just... Where were we? When I actually think that we were completely in a different space and time when there was nobody, there was nobody there, there wasn't a single car, there wasn't a single light, there wasn't a single sound, and even the sound of the deep leaves couldn't have been there because there are no leaves. Where were we? Where did we go through when we went through those strips of mist? Because wherever it was, there was nobody else, and time and space and reality were totally different to the one that we experience as this everyday one but we didn't know that and that to me makes this experience more real and more valuable because although it's my personal experience I hope that you can tell that I am being completely authentic with you not elaborating on this just telling you as it was but what do you make of this the only conclusion I can draw and it's not very much of one, is that reality is much more complex and nebulous and flexible than we have any idea of. Yes, we could have gone through some sort of military experiment and gone into an altered state here. Yes, we could have been affected by the Earth energies. Yes, we could have been affected by the electromagnetic energies. And these are theories that were put in these two books here that my story featured in in later years. But I don't have any theory. I don't know. All I know is that this was a different space, that this could have been a portal experience, that and that reality shifted. And not just in one way, but in lots of ways, not even consistently. To find out that we couldn't even really have parked there, to find out the moon phase was wrong, to find out the stone is in the wrong place, etc., etc., where, was I bit, were we being affected by the orange ball of light? Obviously that was important because it was interacting with us and it was that was the thing that triggered the whole thing off. But where does the black figure fit in? Do you have any thoughts on this? I'm not looking for concrete answers because I really don't think there can be. I think we're dealing with something here that is not going to be easy to pin down. But after all this time, I really would like to share this with you and to get some responses from you. Please, whatever your thoughts are, let me know and I promise I will get back to you as soon as I can because this has been with me for a long time and it just got it because of what I've just researched, it's just actually got weirder. There's a phrase called quantum pollution and I wonder whether other realities have, have even affected this one since so that things aren't even remotely the same as they were before i really don't know anyway going now i'm going to get cut off lots of love thanks for bearing with me and i'll be back soon with another video take care of yourselves lots of love bye